All right, so as folks continue to join us here in the virtual space, we'll get started. Hi everyone, I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We are live with Maggie Shipstead and Beth Ann Patrick discussing Great Circle. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase the book directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, please use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions during the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To enable captions, click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of the screen. And before we dive in, we really do wanna thank you out there for joining us. We are so grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce this great new novel. After being rescued as infants from a sinking ocean liner in 1914, Marion and Jamie Graves are raised by their dissolute uncle in Missoula. There, after encountering a pair of barnstorming pilots passing through town in beat up biplanes, Marion commences her lifelong love affair with flight. At 14, she drops out of school and finds an unexpected and dangerous patron in a wealthy bootlegger who provides a plane and subsidizes her lessons, an arrangement that will haunt her for the rest of her life, even as it allows her to fulfill her destiny, circumnavigating the globe by flying over the North and South Pole. A century later, Hadley Baxter is cast to play Marion in a film that centers on Marion's disappearance in Antarctica. Vibrant, canny, disgusted with the claustrophobia of Hollywood, Hadley is eager to redefine herself after a romantic film franchise has imprisoned her in the grip of cult celebrity. Her immersion into the character of Marion unfolds thrillingly alongside Marion's own story as the two women's fates and their hunger for self-determination in vastly different geographies and times collide. Epic and emotional, meticulously researched and gloriously told, Great Circle is a monumental work of art and a tremendous leap forward for the prodigiously gifted Maggie Shipstead. Shipstead will be in conversation with Beth Ann Patrick, a writer, author, and critic whose monthly column on hot books appears in the Washington Post, where she also reviews frequently. Her book reviews and author interviews also appear in the LA Times, the Boston Globe, at NPR Books, on LitHub, and many others. Patrick is working on a memoir for Counterpoint Press. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Maggie Shipstead and Beth Ann Patrick. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Julia. What a thank lovely you, Julia. introduction. And thank you all for being here today. Maggie, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be speaking with you about your third novel. Uh, Likewise. Thanks for doing this. I'm so absolutely. excited. Absolutely. And so what I want to ask first is we've just heard the plot of the book. We've heard what it's about. But how would you describe your huge, sprawling and also very deep story? Just the story itself, not the, all of the plot points. Um, well, when I do my my quick description of it, I always say that it's about a female aviator who disappears in 1950 while trying to fly over the world. Fly, sorry, trying to fly around the world north south over the poles, and then it's about a modern day movie star playing her in a movie about her life. Um, but it's sort of more thematically, I guess, when I was in the process of writing it, a friend of mine asked if I could describe it in one word, and my word was scale. Um, which is not necessarily the sexiest word, but it was from the beginning, one of my preoccupations was how does a single life measure up against the scale of a planet? How does a single life measure up against all the other lives being lived? And uh, how does our moment measure up about against geological time, that sort of thing. Um, so that was, was something that really drove me. And then I was also really interested in, um, through the lens of Hadley in particular, the movie star, sort of getting at this idea of how much is lost when each of us dies. We take basically our whole experience with us. Mm -hmm. And Hadley is in the position of trying to reconstruct a life that has been over for 70 years. And um, the reader gets a really intimate look at Marion. And then they get to see Hadley as sort of as this archeologist trying to figure out something about this lost person. Um, so yeah, to me, those were, those were some of the driving forces of the book. After reading Great Circle, I have to say that scale does seem a very sexy word um, <laughs> to me because it does have to do so much with 
how we measure anything. I'm not going to break into, you know, 525,600 minutes, <laughs> um, but, you know, we can measure the globe in a great circle. We can measure a life in decades. We can measure deeds in an instant. Um, the book encompasses almost every kind of measurement that I can think of. But I want to start with something a little more visual. I told you about this. Marion Graves has a twin brother named Jamie. And as the novel uh, progresses, we know that he becomes a renowned painter, uh, a somewhat reclusive one, but uh, you know, very, very well known. And people have Jamie Graves paintings on their walls and know that they have something of great value. I was wondering if the book's cover was an homage to his painting, but you told me that it's actually a painting from World War One, is that correct? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, you'd have to ask the the brilliant cover designer Kelly Blair um, what she was if if she thought about Jamie at all. But it is a, a take on a, a pre existing painting. I'm looking at it. So Kelly added, you know, yes. obviously the typeface and the the circle elements. But this the underlying painting is um, from I think about 1919, and mm -hmm. it's called Spiral Descent, and was painted by a, an English painter named Christopher Nevinson, and it's a a, a World War One painting. That's but, really interesting to me, and the reason I wanted to ask about the painting, which is beautiful on the cover, it is beautiful, um, is that. Jamie's work in the book, his fictional work, his visual art is informed by the idea of origami, uh, which I really love. And I wanted you to talk about that a little bit and talk about why it is that that would appeal to someone like Jamie, who is so um, careful with his life in so many ways. And yeah. I know this might seem like we're getting off track. I promise you all <laughs> that we're, we're not. I have, I have a, a method behind my madness. <laughs> um, yeah, so Jamie, uh, it's funny because it's going to take us right back to scale. Mm -hmm. Jamie, uh, when he's sort of a, a very young, struggling artist, he sees the first photos that were taken by the first uh, men to ascend into the stratosphere, which was in a balloon. And you can, they were the first people to photograph the curvature of the horizon right. sort of that we're now familiar with. And so this sort of lights up his imagination and he starts to try with his paintings to capture more of a sense of, of immensity. And um, he's preoccupied by, I keep using preoccupied, but he is by, you know, the difference between our visual sort of dome that surrounds us versus what you can put on a, on a flat canvas. And so one of his methods, he tries curving, what he's painting and then he starts trying to incorporate sort of folding into it to just sort of pack more in which um, I suppose there's probably a connection to the length of this book and all the things that yeah, are packed no, into I, it. No, I wasn't <laughs> thinking that but I do think that it's very interesting to um, think about Marion and her story and how the book folds her life up against a modern woman's life and that they make more sense when they are folded together in that very mm. precise way that you do. And let me just add something else. Many historical novels have the conceit of there is a woman in a time period, not our own, who then has a relative or a young woman researching something who finds out these secrets. And in a way, it's almost as if you're doing something different here. Hadley doesn't really want to be researching anyone else's life. She is not trying to find her lost great grandmother or what happened to the village or anything like that. Hadley would probably like at the very beginning of the story to just have everyone and everything go away. But again, that conflation of Marion and Hadley's lives, was that something that was with you as you conceived the book? So I never outline or plan my novels and mm -hmm. I would oh. if I could. Um, it just doesn't work for me. I, I can't quite think that far ahead. And then it starts to feel like connecting the dots. Um, and I really gain ideas and inspiration sort of from momentum as I'm going. And particularly in this book from research, I would come across something and and add it in. But Hadley was a component um, quite early. I think within a month of when I started writing, I happened to write 
this sort of standalone few pages in this intense first person voice of a movie star. And I know most people won't have read the book because it's today, but right. <laughs> <laughs> unless you're a very fast reader. Um, but uh, she's, she's in sort of a Twilight-esque um, giant film franchise and she's dating her co-star and everyone's sort of putting the pressure or the love they feel for the fictional couple onto this real life couple. And so she sort of publicly cheats on him. She leaves a club knowing she'll be photographed with a pop star. Um, and wait, now I can't remember what I say. Oh yes. And so, um, <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote, I wrote that section, which on the surface has nothing to do with Marion Graves, which I'd already started writing these sort of early sections with the ship launch in 1909. Um, but I just knew it had to be there. It had to be part of it. So I came up with the idea that Hadley would be, would be playing Marion. But one of the most difficult things and extremely difficult writing process was getting the two stories to come together to what I felt was the right degree. And I did have versions where Hadley was kind of like in the library going through boxes of stuff. And, right. you know, um, and one of my favorite books really uh, and touchstones for this book was Possession, which has... Uh. A, you what know, a good a, touchstone. Yeah, I love it. And it's such a, it's a, a book that also sort of, I found liberating because there are parts of it I'll read over and over forever. And there are parts of it I'll never read again. And I just had to be okay with writing a book that was also like that, that just had sort of um, all these different notes in it. So um, yeah, so Hadley was there from the beginning. And on top of her sort of plot function, I also just really wanted a different voice. I didn't want this sort of loaf of historical fiction. I wanted something yeah. that cut through it. So sort of like a sharper, more acidic um, voice to sort of give me an outlet, give the reader a break. And also, yeah, just, just bring this different lens to Marion. And I want to mention for anyone in the audience who isn't aware of Possession, it's a novel that came out, I believe, in 1991 by A.S. Byatt, the British. I think that's writer. exactly right. Good job. <laughs> you know what I know? Because that was the book I saved when I was in graduate school oh for um, the end when I passed my orals and I could read for pleasure again. Wow. That was so that's why I remember it so well. It was really, uh, you know, such a treat. But it really was almost the beginning of that trend of the mm -hmm. you know the combining one woman's story with another mm -hmm. but again Marion and Hadley it felt, it felt so different because from the beginning Hadley wasn't searching her search only comes through a process that she goes through and we will talk about that uh, but I have to say I love the idea of them being folded up against each other because their stories come, wait for it, full circle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Mm, I couldn't that. Go. So, uh, you know, the idea of gr the great circle, I want to talk about some of your travel perspectives, but I also want to find out when and how you learned about the mathematical and geographical concept of the great circle, because I think that's fascinating. And it's one of the things that does make your novel come together in such an arresting way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was aware of the idea of great circles, um, as many people are, just when you look at your flight path and a, a long, especially a long haul commercial flight. And, you know, from, I guess the East Coast, well, lots of flights will go over the North Pole. And mm -hmm. when you look at a map, you're like, no, it should just go straight. But so <laughs> as, as it explains in the book, a great circle is the circumference of a sphere at its largest point. So on our globe, the equator is a great circle and all the lines of longitude are great circles. And then the shortest distance between two points is some segment of a great circle. Um, so this was actually my only book where I had the title from the beginning. Uh, partly because of that. And it was a process of, of choosing which flight path Marion would take, which in 1950 would have been, it would have been difficult, borderline impossible to, to mm -hmm. do a flight like this. And my brother um, is just leaving the Air Force after 20 years and he doesn't fly anymore, but he used to. And so it was really helpful to have a pilot like in the very first days of writing this to sit down with and say, you know, if you were flying, like what airplane would you choose and what route would you take? Um, oh, that's yeah, fascinating. Yeah. And then the circularity, of course, started to, to inform the structure of the book, too, I think. Inevitably. It, it, it had to. And 
Marion comes up with the idea of flying pole to pole relatively late in the book, which was surprising to me simply because I'd heard about the book and I knew about this major plot point before I read it. And I kept thinking, well, when, when, great <laughs> circle. Uh, but at that point, it makes a great deal of sense because it is, uh, as I cheekishly said, um, it is the culmination of life. It is a full circle sort of thing when she makes this decision. But um, what was it about Marion at that point that made it possible for her to have that dream? And I know there are some machinations that go on that make it possible financially, and, mm -hmm. but I mean more psychologically, psychically. Yeah, well, it would have been one of the few things in that era of sort of post-war that hadn't been done. Like people mm -hmm. had flown around the world along the equator, but this hadn't been done. I think in real life, nobody did this flight until the 60s. Um, and I can get into to why it was so difficult. Mm -hmm. But it my I don't know if my agent's on this or not, but she and I had <laughs> many uh, discussions when she first read the book. She was my first reader. And she was like, well, why? Does Marion want to do this? It's dangerous. There's sort of inherently no point. Like this is the this, this circular element of it too, is that you go to this great effort to fly around the world and you're back where you started. You know, the horizon's still just stretching out in front of you all over again. And so I really um, had to think about it and thought about it a lot and kind of came up with the answer that there's no real reason. But the best explanation of this sort of impulse um, I found was in a book called The Ice Balloon by Alec, I think it's Wilkinson or Wilkerson, I can't, I can never remember his, um, which one, but it's about a failed North Pole attempt in a hot air balloon in uh, the early 20th century. And he's describing these early explorers and why they did these miserable, difficult, deadly things. And, and he says that just the very obscurity of the impulse to them was persuasive. Like to them, it was, it was more of a reason to go if they didn't quite know why. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's kind of what I, what I thought Marion would bring to it as well. Just she, she has this sort of vision and at the end of sort of after the war, she, she's in South Africa and is sailing back to the U.S. and sort of looks across the sea and knows that Antarctica is down there and it kind of plants in her mind that, that she has to see it. But as I said, it would have been um, nearly impossible. And the big problem was Antarctica. And to fly mm -hmm. from South Africa across Antarctica to New Zealand, you would have need to, needed to refuel this airplane twice. And there were no permanent bases at that time. Mm -hmm. So to make it plausible, I aligned her flight with a real life expedition to East, Af East Antarctica that was there um, at that time and could have brought fuel. And then there was a real life um, series of bases called Little America on the, right. the other side and they would have cached fuel. So that was sort of my, um, my setup, but it also would have been just unbelievably dangerous. You know, you don't have to explain anything, Maggie, this <laughs> historical fiction. You can do whatever you want. Although, of course, people are going to put the puzzle pieces together because we can't help it. And so before we go into a few other ideas in the book that I really want to tease out with you, I have to talk with you about your own experience of Antarctica. Uh, what a difficult word that is to really enunciate, Antarctica. And I, you uh... spent three weeks there, is that correct? I've actually been twice. I went um, the first time, I wrote a modern love about this, uh, which people yes. are free to look up and you might be about to ask about. Um, I went on a five week trip from New Zealand, uh, which takes a really long time because uh, it's Antarctica there is just further south. The reason everyone goes from South America is it's a day and a half crossing of the nasty but but narrow Drake Passage to get to the Antarctic Peninsula. And most of those trips don't even cross the Antarctic Circle, which is at 66 degrees south. Um, and when I went from New Zealand, we went to 78 degrees south. So super, super, super far south. Um, <laughs> a lot of time on a very angry ocean um, in a not very stable converted Russian research vessel. And it was, it was incredible. It was a life-changing um, experience and just a, a wildly remote, um, incredibly beautiful uh, place that wants to kill you. <laughs> like a place Antarctica that wants to kill you. And uh, I've seen some of your photos um, from that 
trip, courtesy of your publisher, of course. But I do have to ask about the Modern Love column, not for um, pur prurient reasons, but because I think it has a lot to do with your characters and with the relationships that they have throughout their long lives. Your Modern Love column is about a relationship that you had with someone on that Russian ship, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. And it's about temporality and about how you can have, you know, a lot of great emotion and great feeling, even in something that is not going to last very long. So that has to do with almost every character in this book. So talk for a couple of minutes about that, if you would. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, connections between people come in all shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. And with the, the man I dated who The Modern Love is about, a lot of our connection was just in our mutual fascination with and, and being drawn to this place and these, these natural environments. And um, we didn't really have a ton to talk about all the time, but we had this sort of deep-seated uh, shared feeling for, for these parts of the world. And, mm -hmm. and I think in the book, there, there are characters who love each other even profoundly, but aren't meant to be a traditional couple or aren't meant to make a life together. And someone else, when I was in the process of writing, um, asked me if it was a love story. And I immediately flatly said no, um, which I stand by. But in a way, it is because it's the story of all the loves that Marion has in her life, which are, are um, you know, some are catastrophic, but still profound and happen and um, others come and go. And uh, yeah, I wanted to sort of steer away from a sort of marriage plotty type. Well, that's uh, what, yeah, that's what I was going to say is it not it is not a marriage plot novel. It is a, a great American novel that escapes that. In, and so one of the lines and you will have to remind me who says this, but it really struck me is one thing I learned is that you don't just love a person, you love a vision of your life with them. And the reason I, that really hit me was, I think that's almost how the marriage plot was invented mm. because people decided, I see this vision of what will be in the future. And they go towards that instead of experiencing what is right in front of them. Mm -hmm. Does yeah, that resonate with the I characters? think so. Absolutely. Um, and I love, I mean, to be clear, I love a marriage plot, but uh, <laughs> this, this was not going to be one. Yeah. And I, there's a part yeah. where um, Hadley, the movie star character is being interviewed for a magazine and, and she says something along the lines of, you know, if you don't believe you love someone, you don't love them. And I think that's true. I think love is, an, is faith, you know, to an extent. And um yeah, I think that faith can be lost, can be, can come back, all these things. It's a, and a, all these things, something that I found really interesting in the book, and I hope other readers will agree with this, is there's lots of lists. And sometimes it's straight up a list, like when Hadley and um, Randall, are, are have taken the shrooms oh, oh redwood kidding? redwood redwood sorry redwood that's no, okay there's too many names yeah. the <laughs> and they're they're lying outside in the la air and just you know listing different things about you know what makes la la and and that kind of thing then there are lists of things that need to be taken on a particular journey there are lists of things that make up um a you know a person's wardrobe there are a lot of different kinds and then these when i say lists I don't mean they're numbered or necessarily bulleted, but there's a lot of accounting, a, mm -hmm. a lot of accountability in Great Circle. Does that sound like something you can relate to? Yeah, I mean, they're probably, it's funny, I like a list, like I, and I think I remember at some point I was resisting putting writing them. And I don't even think it was this book. It was something else. And then I read a book that I can't remember either, where there were tons of lists and I really loved it. And I was like, all oh, right, I can just list things. But I mean, there's a certain efficiency to it, particularly with a book like this, where um, 
there's just a lot to cover. And I was wary of, you know, there's always a danger when you do a lot of research that you start including things purely because you've gone to the trouble of looking them up. Like everyone has to know that you looked this thing up. And so I was trying to avoid right, that, right. but also to cover a lot of ground quickly. So like something I just uh, was asked to read aloud the other day was a list of things Marion did in Alaska or places she flew. And so there's sort of a speed, which I think, you know, connects to the velocity of the book in just like putting out there what, what happens. Um, but then what else do you ask? Sorry. I'm like, well, no, 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 it's okay because, um, actually, uh, you know, I'm looking at a few of the things that I'd written down that I really loved. And a lot of them are, are, are things like Marion, um, feeling, like being a fixed point, being the center mm. of the universe. And uh, maybe I am the center of the universe. Did you ever think of that? She says at once one, one point. Another thing that she um, says is the world unfurls and unfurls and there is always more. A line, a circle is insufficient. I look forward and there is the horizon. I look back, horizon. What's past is lost. I am already lost to my future. And the reason these words, uh, well, they're, they're beautiful in themselves, but I also thought there are so many times where the lists help you move from one point in time mm -hmm. or in geography to another. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really fascinating thing about the um, actual construction of Great Circle. You have to get to a lot of different places. It may feel like we spend some time in Missoula, but Missoula is by no means the end of the world for this story. Um, the end of the world isn't even Hawaii. It's not LA. It's, it's not Svalbard. It's, I mean, it's, it's everywhere in the world. I, you know, no, I don't think we spend a lot of time in Asia, but we even get to Bechuana land. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, part of what I was thinking that I then got lost in was um, I'm also just really detailed oriented person. And so to mm -hmm. me, you know, they talk about telling details in fiction and I don't really think in those terms a lot, but it's true that they are. I think a, a detail can really um, get a lot across. And yeah, as you said, in some ways her circle is a kind of list. It's a, a sequence of destinations like travel um, is a list, a list has a beginning and an end. Um, so yeah, it was it was sort of a way of organizing a lot of different things. And, and as you said, just creating connections between um, sort of disparate pieces. And, and one thing I was, when uh, you mentioned that I was thinking of, so for those who haven't read the book has these sort of sections called incomplete histories. And right. the very first one I wrote was about Missoula and I had spent two months in Missoula um, right before I started writing this book, sort of just by chance. And at that point I was thinking I was gonna set it in Nebraska, um, partly because of the long history of sort of pilots in the US from the Great mm -hmm. Plains. Um, and then after I left Missoula, I was like, you know, it'd be more sort of topographically interesting setting is, is Montana. And um, I had been living on the side of this mountain sort of overlooking the valley and the city. And the mountain has these sort of strange horizontal lines on them and I on it. And I didn't know what they were until after I left. And I read about the great glacial Lake Missoula. So, you know, 15,000 years ago, this finger of the ice sheet coming down from Canada plugged a river and it created this 2000 mile square, just massive lake, incredibly deep, incredibly huge. And then the ice dam broke at some point and all the water emptied out across the Pacific Northwest and really shaped the landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, when I came across that, I was like, well, this has to go in, this, in the book too. It's sort of like when I wrote <laughs> that little piece with Hadley. And so I just kind of adopted a different voice and made a leap and said, 15,000 years ago, there's this lake. And then I moved forward through time kind of rapidly. So that's also sort of the velocity I was talking about earlier that you can yes, sort of gain it, it from is, a series. It is almost a, a velocity like um, the reader is taking flight even when the characters aren't necessarily in a plane or the cockpit. And that uh, I think is a very exciting part of the book um, in terms of narrative structure. You're not always at the same pace. You're not always at the, in the same voice, um, et cetera. But I want to jump back um, to what we were talking about a few minutes ago in terms of relationships and we were talking about your modern love column and I want to talk about the very 
I think, quiet ways in which you've brought the idea of queerness, queer life, and queer people into Great Circle. Because many of the characters have facets to their love lives that didn't fit with the times that they were living in. Sometimes that facet might be a woman having an affair out of wedlock. Sometimes it might be a man in the military uh, who likes to perform in drag. Sometimes it's a person who is bisexual, it, but it's never something that is, uh, if there's not a big banner, hello. <laughs> and here we have the bearded lady. That's not it. It's a, it's much more integrated into the narrative and into the ideas of the characters. So what, what was that like to play with? Because sometimes, again, there are long, quite, standard traditional relationships. So it wasn't like you were throwing it all out. The idea wasn't about only focusing on one type of thing, but when it is important for a character, and I'm trying not to give any spoilers, can you tell it's taking me so long to, to ask this question? Sorry, everyone. But uh, you know, what was that like? Because there is no way that one author could have experienced all of those things in one person. And I'm not by any means saying any author should have to um, write only about themselves. What I mean is that takes a, a lot. It takes a lot of determination. It takes a lot of compassion. It takes a lot of imagination. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, uh, since I don't plan, you know, it, this also <laughs> sort of arose organically, uh, partly due to research and partly just due to what I think would have happened. I think, so Marion, you know, has this really feral free range childhood and it sort of doesn't occur to her that her gender would place any limitations on her. Right. And then as she sort of starts to bump up against those as a teenager, when she wants to fly, her sort of obvious solution is um, to semi disguise herself as a boy to try to get jobs and to try to fly. And it sort of works and sort of doesn't. And, you know, she just wouldn't have had any vocabulary whatsoever, even throughout her life um, for gender fluidity. Mm -hmm. And I think she just never has to label it. And there are various times in her life when she sort of slides between genders. Um, uh, and then something that happened in my research, I think when I was reading about Missoula was I came across um, these historical accounts of what we would call a trans person or Native Americans would probably call a two-spirited person mm -hmm. um, named Sitting in the Water Grizzly. And it was, uh, he was born a, a woman and married a member of David Thompson, the explorer's sort of retinue. Um, mm -hmm. And that didn't, she was creating all kinds of trouble. They kicked her out. She went back to her tribe and said, oh, actually they transformed me into a man. And so then started living as a man and eventually took a wife and um, had an incredible gift for languages, which I think is so fascinating. It was this go-between between, between all the tribes and all the Westerners mm -hmm. and or not even Westerners, Europeans. And um, I, what was so fascinating to me too was that in the, the European accounts of meeting this person, they aren't particularly scandalized. Um, and I think maybe Native Americans just seem so other to them that then when somebody switched from being a, a woman to a man, they're just like, this is what they do. And, and so they sort of observe in this interested fashion how, uh, you know, Mrs. Boisvert has now appeared and is sitting in the water grizzly and has his own <laughs> wife. And um, there's sort of a, he became almost a semi-mythical figure the way he died and he sort of in some ways sacrificed himself. So, so that uh, became just a touchstone, uh, not, not quite for Marion, but, but her friend Caleb tells her this story and, and that puts this idea in her mind that, you, that gender is not absolute and you can, you can move um, between them possibly. Um, and then other things also came out of my research, like you mentioned, uh, there's a, a sequence in a, a 
sort of a Stalag, a POW camp in Germany in World War II where men are performing in drag. And this was very real. Um, and sometimes these performers would be sort of celebrities within their camp and they would even print up photographs of themselves in drag and sell hundreds of copies of them. Wow. And, um, men would write these letters home sort of saying, you know, he's more woman than any woman I've ever seen. And it just created this really sort of interesting rich moment where um, really sort of before rich. the reaction of the 50s, there was, there was a bit of a looser uh, moment that was just brought by the, the incredible upheaval of the war. Exactly. And by these circumstances in the Stalag Lufts where there were so few, um, you know, re reminders of a, a life of joy, a life mm -hmm. of happiness, a life of entertainment. There, there is uh, so much going on. And yet you just mentioned a name that I haven't brought up. And I know it's not part of the marriage plot, but people who will be falling in love with Caleb. All <laughs> kinds of people will be falling in love with Ka Caleb. Um, Caleb Bitterroot, who is half um, European and half Salish. Maybe. He's not Maybe. quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But he is almost... Um, He's part of the trio of Jamie and Marion from childhood in Montana. And he and Marion, this is not a spoiler, they do love each other. They do have a lifelong um, love affair, but it happens sometimes. It's not always there. They're, sometimes they're separated by miles. Sometimes they're separated by slights and, and um, ideas that they each have. But he is... It's not just that he's a hunk. He really is, though. Caleb's a hunk with his long braid down his back and everything and, you know, all the outdoor work he does. But he is also a curiously, I don't want to call him a moral center, Maggie. He's more of a strength center hmm. to the book. Um, what do, how do you feel about Caleb? Yeah, so Caleb um, is somebody Marion knows from childhood. He's the child of a prostitute who sort of lives down the creek from where uh, Marion and Jamie live. And so as children, they're all sort of running around together. And, and as they get older, uh, things become more complex. Um, yeah, I think he's someone who in some ways is more similar to Marion than anyone she meets and is, is more accepting of her. And he kind of at sometimes pushes back against her boundaries um, that she places on their relationship. And he's very upfront with her when he's unhappy, but he sort of comes and goes from her life. And, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to put him, you know, too much in service to her. He's not at right. her feet. He's not no. um, doing her bidding, but he does uh, seem to have sort of an innate understanding of her, which even if she's resistant to the possibility of, of, a more traditional love with him. She, of course, I think it's probably irresistible for most of us, this feeling of being understood. That Yes, that feeling of being understood and wholly accepted mm -hmm. once you're understood. Um, but one of the things I also have to ask about, I know we, we have a few minutes before um, I start throwing the questions from the audience at you, is the idea of this gender fluidity that isn't just about sex, sexuality, and intimacy. It's also about feminism and humanism. Uh, one of the characters that I will never forget from Great Circle is Ruth, uh, Marion's fellow pilot during World War II. And she writes Ruth a letter at one point, and she's talking about women and men. And she says, we women get angry and nothing happens. Men get angry and the whole world burns up. Then when we want to do our part, they're always trying to keep us out of danger because heaven forbid, we should be allowed to decide for ourselves. Their worst fear is that one day we'll end up owning our lives the same as they do. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, truth bomb from Maggie Shipstead. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, to contextualize that a little bit. So uh, in World War II, um, we had a domestic service like this, but it, it came along a little bit later. But in the UK, they had an organization called the Air Transport Auxiliary, which was a civilian, um, both men and women pilots who mm -hmm. would transport warplanes um, where they needed to be. And so I think historically 25 
American women uh, went over to fly for them. And it was incredibly dangerous. They flew really rattle trap planes that might have been battle damaged, or um, there were Germans flying around. There were all these barrage balloons, just mm -hmm. they weren't allowed to use instruments. Um, and uh, yeah, I I, um, I went to Stanford to the Hoover Institution. They have papers there, um, including all these letters, wartime letters from three or four of the American women who went over. And and some of those sentiments, um, they tended to be a little bit more polite about them, but they were in there and they, they uh, went over because they craved action in a way and wanted to do right. something, which, you know, was was also some toothpaste that was very difficult to get back in the tube after the war. So to speak. Yeah. Although in the United States, unfortunately, somehow um, we did get a little of that toothpaste back in with the spatula and there was a lot of conformity, as we all know. Um, but the idea of feminism takes so many different forms in Great Circle. There are, again, without spoiling anything for anyone. There's Marion, who's quite unconventional. And really, I think we can safely use the term gender defiant for Marion. Mm -hmm. Then there is Jamie's uh, great love, Sarah. And she lives a very conventional life as a very beautiful and elegant young woman. There are women who are pay a lot of attention to their physicality. And this includes in Hadley's chapters, you know, the people she meets, and then women who are very arty and unselfconscious. Um, so it's about the fact that there have always been people, and this comes back again to the gender fluidity, who have lived different lives, but maybe we haven't been looking for them. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that's some of what I found in my research, like, for example, with the drag. But I also think, you know, I didn't I didn't sit down and think, oh, I'm going to write a feminist like I never have a point <laughs> to prove with my novels. There's no sort of agenda or lesson to be learned. But, you know, even just believing as women, believing in your own free will and your entitlement to do and live how you want, that's a feminist act. And so, of course, a book about someone who's motivated by freedom um, probably above all else, becomes a feminist narrative, sort of inevitably. It's really true. And uh, I, uh, I have one, and speaking of things that people don't look for, I, I swear this is the last thing that I take from the book before we um, go on to questions. I could not believe this. And here's the paragraph. And it's really beautifully set off in the book. In January 1938, a spectacular aurora ripples over Europe. First, a green glow on the horizon, then someone is connecting the stars with a quill pen, red ink bleeding upward, arching across in crimson pulses, in orange plumes that unfurl and vanish. London must be burning, people in Britain say, gazing at the sky. Firefighters in the Alps are sent to chase flickering reflections on the snow. Across the continent, People call their local police, ask, is it war? Is it fire? Not yet. It's a solar storm. And I, I, it must be excruciating for you to have your writing read to you by you know, <laughs> the moderator. But I read this and thought, there was a solar storm in 1938. We never talk about this. I mean, the world did have some preoccupations. It got buried in the news cycle. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What, what, a, what an amazing, spectacular thing to have happened. To have Yeah, been. yeah. It was visible so far south, like even in the Caribbean could see Is it. Is there any really news reel of that? I don't know. I've never seen, I mean, I, I, I suspect camera capabilities wouldn't have been set up for the Aurora then. Although now one thing that's strange about the Aurora is that it's one of those things that looks better on, on your camera than with your eyes. I've seen it a handful of times and you're always like, is that it? And then you take a picture and it's this brilliant green, you know, swirl. So I don't know, but yeah, um, that was sort of a, a very bad omen, I think that happened, but it, but it's just a, an incredible um, moment to be happening in the midst of all of your characters' lives and in the midst of this war that comes right in the middle of everything. So 
Oh, just amazing. I wanted to make sure to mention that so that other people could learn about it. Uh, but we do need to get to questions and I promise I'm going to get to all of them. We don't have too many right now, but everyone drop something in the Q&A button, um, drop a question in there and I will do my best. So the first one I'm going to ask is the last one we just got, which is, did you always have the title as Great Circle or did you consider the great circle, a great circle, et cetera? Um, if so, why did you end up with just the phrase great circle? And thank you, Karen Dukes, for asking that. I did always call it great circle, although now I sort of wish I'd done the great circle because everybody's really determined for that to be the title. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> it's uh, the New York Times, even when the review went up the other day, it was as the great circle. And, and so many people have read the whole book and still think it's the great circle, which I, the reason I didn't do it that way is because to me, I didn't want to imply that the subject of the book was Marion's great circle. And some of it was the uh. sort of larger sense of circularity that we were talking about earlier and just the notion of great circle. Um, so yeah, it was just to move it a bit away from that being the constricted subject, but you know, in retrospect, I'm not so sure. <laughs> oh, it's so hard. It's so hard. Uh, uh, our delightful um, fellow writer slash author, Courtney Mom, is asking, in a book of this scope and length, a lot must have gotten left out. What didn't work or didn't fit in the book? What got left behind? Sure. Hi, Courtney. Um, <laughs> So my draft, it took me three years and three months to write a first draft um, starting in fall of 2014. And so that first draft was 980 pages long. It was almost 300,000 words. Um, and this little wisp of a thing that it is now would be <laughs> about a quarter shorter. Um, it would be about 750 manuscript pages and it's under 600 typeset pages. So. A lot was cut. Um, uh, my editor and I had a very clear but contentious understanding that it needed to be shrunk with every draft we did, which was about three or four drafts. Um, and really the bulk of the cutting came from small pervasive cuts. And that was one advantage of having such a long book was that if I cut something on every page, it added up to be a lot of pages. Mm, interesting. But there were things that were sort of more uh, discrete units that were lost. Like I used to have this weird plot line with um, Jamie where he joined this community in Canada that's called the Dukabors. And they're sort of Russian Quakers, basically. They came from Russia, they're pacifists, yeah. they live communally, they sort of famous in the early 20th century for these nude protest marches through the Canadian plains, which is crazy, you know, and um, Jamie is very tenderhearted. He's um, sort of baffled by horror and violence. And uh, so, yeah, I had him go there. But when, uh, after I sold it to Kanaf, my, my editor was like, this is just one weird thing too many. So that had to go. <laughs> You know, gave me some pa some pages, but then I had to write a whole new arc for him, so that you know right. lost me those pages all, all over again. Um, there used to be an incomplete history of Antarctica that's not there anymore. That was sort of like when the continents were one. <laughs> you know, it really started. But it, my editor is right about this as well. It just came at a point in the book where nobody wanted to sort of deep dive into into Antarctic natural history after <laughs> having read. <laughs> that's tough to know. Um, and that actually leads to um, our ne next question from Shazia Hafiz Ramji, which is how did you plan the intersections of the historical events and the events in the actor's timeline in the present? Because that it, that is an excellent question because whether the historical event is uh, one that's based on reality or it's you know fictionalized you had to decide when Hadley would come back onto the stage in a way yeah and that got reshuffled a lot also in drafts um it was I was trying to get that balance right of of when we needed kind of to go to Hadley and also keep Hadley present enough in um in the reader's mind. But I also um just as far as the intersection of the historical events and the reality of the book 
um, you know, from the beginning, whenever I said I was writing a book about a female pilot, people would be like, like Amelia Earhart. And that's a completely fair response. But I was yeah. also, you know, adamant that it wasn't about Amelia Earhart. Mm-hmm. However, and so part of the way I combated, combated that was um, to have the book, just like the book acknowledges the existence of Amelia Earhart and, and many other pilots and sort of uses them as a, to situate the action. Um, But I was also always inspired by Amelia Earhart in the sense that I think almost certainly she crashed in the ocean and drowned. There's almost no other possibility, but but disappearance and death register really differently. And so the fact that she vanished creates this vacuum that all these narratives sort of rush into, which um, as an author is useful, but but yeah, so that was that was I was always in this sort of funny gray space between historical reality and uh, and my written reality, which Hadley maybe shares. I, and I, we have several more questions to get to. And one, uh, so I'm going to try to ask one question from each person and then go back if that person has second questions. So uh, Donna Minocchio says, I am intrigued and inspired by your writing process that lets the story and characters emerge. Do you have a regular um, writing routine every day in a certain place? Um, And what, you know, what does that routine look like? Yeah, I don't. I mean, when I'm, when I'm really working, I will write every day. And there were certainly periods where I wrote consistently every day, including weekends, which were sort of meaningless to me. But in the seven years um, between my last book and this book, I also started writing professionally for travel magazines. So I was gone a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, In 2019, I was out of the country for more than a hundred days. And by that time we were in sort of deep edits and it was okay. But um, in some of the early years, I mean, I'd be disrupted for a month or more while I was gone. I just went right. So I had to be, which I think those breaks were fine. It let me get a little bit of distance and then come back to it. But I, and also pre-pandemic, I really like to write outside the house just to go to a mm-hmm. coffee shop and sort of a stick and carrot sort of thing. Like you can have a huge coffee, but you have to take your laptop. <laughs> you have to, yeah. to go. <laughs> um, so I would do that a lot. I have been talking a lot uh, when I talk about this book about the writing application called Scrivener. Yes. Um, it's actually in my acknowledgements because I could not have written this book without it. And it's basically an organizational and word processing app that just, um, it's difficult to explain, but it allows you to keep many documents in one place and reshuffle them and look at them all together. So that was a huge part of my process as well, because it's just not possible to keep this, um, this amount of words in your brain. I still haven't learned Scrivener um, and I'm not going to ask you to teach me. Um, you have enough on your plate, but I just want anyone out there who I, I know so many authors and writers who have said it has been a lifesaver uh, for their manuscripts. So if, if you don't know about it, Scrivener is a great tool. And it only costs $50. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> Rebecca Gruber says, in this past year, when none of us has been able to travel, your book seems particularly appealing. What does travel mean to you? And you've said that, uh, you just talked a little bit about that. And what do you think it means to people in general in terms of Great Circle? Mm. Yeah, it's funny. The timing of this book, of course, we could not have anticipated even when the publication date was set. Um, I think that was pre-pandemic or or at the very beginning. So it's been... um, you know, I think, yeah, everyone's, this idea of freedom and movement resonates with people more in a different way. Um, I certainly never considered the fact that my travel life might be just sort of swept out from under me at any moment. Um, I was about to leave on an assignment right when the lockdown happened. I, travel means a lot of different things to me. I was not, I was a really shy child. I really didn't want novelty. I didn't want to go anywhere or do anything. Um, and so it's been a slow sort of uh, journey into travel. It's as I've done more things, and and I always say my real life travel and writing this book were symbiotic. And part of it was I knew I needed to see some of these places to write about them. I mean, you can write about places without going there, but the Arctic and the Antarctic, I wasn't sure I could accurately imagine. So I pursued uh, opportunities to go there um, in magazines in particular, writing for them. And then editors kind of got the idea, I, I like to do these stories. And so things things sort of built and my comfort zone sort of gradually expanded as I, um, I, I was rewarded for the risks that I took. So like one example is I've always been afraid of deep water. I really wanted to swim with humpback whales. 
So I, I pitched a story where I did that. I went and I did it. I wasn't terrified. It was fine. And so then that opened me up to doing new things. So travel has been a real source of um, expansion for me. And I think uh, I think that's true for a lot of people. I, I you know, meet people on the road all the time who just are interested in enlarging their lives. In some ways, that's like books, you know, it's books, I think, are our best means of accessing the experiences of others. It's really true. Uh, wonderful question from Jonathan Fiedler, who is asking about cuts in the manuscript, which you talked about, but he asks, was there a section you were especially sad to cut? And you may have answered that with the Jamie subplot, but I just thought maybe it would be great to see if there were any others. Yeah, I wasn't so sad to cut the Jamie subplot because I was like, it was one of those things where I knew in the back of my head, it was one weird thing too many. And then when someone said that to me, I was like, okay, fine. You know, you're just hoping someone doesn't notice. It's one weird thing too many. Um, I was sad to cut the the incomplete history of Antarctica. I, yeah, I'm, <laughs> oh. I'm so into Antarctica and I really liked those sections and I, I liked kind of the magnitude of them, but yeah, say lovey. I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, Jody Franklin asks, can you talk about how you chose the narrative voice and POV? Oh yeah, with a great deal of panic. Um, <laughs> the book is mostly in a pretty close third person past tense with Marion, but the incomplete history sections are sort of an omniscient yes. third person present. And then Hadley's voice is first person past, I think. Um, <laughs> We're not quizzing you on it, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I'm familiar with the concept, but they've made, I've made so many changes, I made a lost track. And just technical choices like that. I mean, it's part of, I think when I start a project, I need a couple elements and often one is the voice, meaning like a settled voice in a verb tense um, and, and sort of a tone. And I didn't always have that with this. And there were definitely days when I'd be in bed being like, should it be in present tense or past tense? Like, like these questions really gave me a lot of stress for some reason. And they, they are so massive. And I did change my mind a couple of times, which becomes an absolutely enormous task to change, for example, the verb tense of something. And for a while I had, yeah. there's the account of Marion's flight is all in one chunk at the end of the book now, but um, for a while it was broken up and sort of interstitial. So you would sort of go into, into the flight and then back and it was just also too much for anyone to keep track of. Um, and those I also had tried in first person um, as Marion's voice and that also didn't work. So some of it was trial and error. Um, and some of it was just looking for maximum flexibility, which you, to me, third person past is kind of the most neutral voice. And so that made sense to me for the bulk of the book. One last question. I really love this one um, as a way for us to wrap up. Karen Dukes again says, can you discuss the sibling love at the heart of this novel? Was that always central to you as you discovered the path that the narrative would take? Yeah, um, I, the book is dedicated to my brother um, and we are not twins like Mary and Jamie, but um, we are very close in our own way. I think we're really um, have sort of a deep soulful connection, even though we don't, you know, talk on the phone all the time. And so uh, definitely the relationship between the siblings was informed by that. And uh, yeah, it's a special, special kind of love, I think. It is a special kind of love, especially with those siblings, uh, Jamie and Marion, uh, as they face a lot of struggles and hardships along the way, but also joys. And I know I have to say goodbye, Maggie Shipstead. Thank you so much for writing Great Circle. Thank you to Knopp for publishing it. And thank you to Politics and Prose for hosting tonight's event. So Julia, take it away. Thank, thank the you, two of you. <laughs> We here at Politics and Prose really want to thank Maggie Shipstead and Beth Ann Patrick for that really heartwarming discussion. And of course, our audience out there for tuning in. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this incredible programming. And we couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. So please follow the link in the chat to get your copy of Great Circle. Um, or you can just head on over to politics-prose.com. And while you're there, feel free to check out the rest of our events calendar for what we've got coming up in May. You won't want to miss it. Um,
But for now, from our shelves to yours, we hope everyone out there is staying safe, staying strong, and of course, staying well-read. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank the two of you again. Bye. Bye.